Good afternoon. I'm Nicole Horry with Think Tech Talks, and we're here in the studio with Margaret Dawson from Red Hat. Welcome. Thank you. Nice to be here. So the conference we were just um, at, um, bringing together all sorts of people in the telecommunications industry, right. in networking, people interested in big data, people from Facebook and Google, yeah. <laughs> also brought you to here to Hawaii. It what did. What part of it are you interested in? Uh, Hawaii or the conference? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not seeing much of Hawaii. I wish I was. So I think what's interesting about this particular conference is that mm -hmm. it's been going on for a long time, 15, 16 years. It's mm -hmm. always here. Um, and it's always interesting because it brings together people you know, who want to enjoy Hawaii, but there's a lot of fairly strategic, serious conversations mm -hmm. going on. And it's changed a lot over the last mm -hmm. 15 years. Uh, telecommunications is no longer just voice, as everyone knows, mm -hmm. um, but it's also not typically local. I mean, what's happening around the world impacts everyone. And now they're having to think about all these different trends and technologies mm -hmm. from cloud computing to big data to the Internet of Things, which we call IoT, um, mm -hmm. how they're serving their customers. And what I love to see is the intersection of all these and just how it's playing out, not only in telecommunications, but really mm -hmm. across every industry. We're having very similar conversations, challenges, because it's happening so fast. Are you seeing areas where better applications and you know small changes mm -hmm. in technology might make the whole network more efficient? Yeah, I think the biggest thing that most IT leaders are, are dealing with that they need to do is deliver things faster. And mm -hmm. so you might need to do that in very small ways. Mm -hmm. And this all goes back to the consumerization of technology, right? Because right. you think about it, people are on their smartphones. Mm -hmm. They're not going to wait even five seconds for a text message to go right. through or to find the website or mm -hmm. you know get directions. And so take that and think about how that translates to even enterprise IT or huge telcos that are delivering services to other businesses, mm -hmm. it has to work at that same speed. And that's yes. both for your internal users, so your employees mm -hmm. want that, right? Because yeah. <laughs> they bring their smartphone into the office and they're like, wait, why do I need to wait for something? But also your customers. And so the little things they can do is things like, maybe it's just do a better portal into that application, right? Mm -hmm. So you have kind of that self-service portal that's web-based, mm -hmm. that's dynamic, that's responsive to mobile devices. Um, you might make small changes to your infrastructure just to help it, you know, kind of support the apps and make it a higher performing infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So there's little things you can do, but I think the biggest challenge they're having is that they've invested so much in, you know, what you could call legacy mm -hmm. technologies, mm -hmm. and they're having to move to this whole new world, yes. and they're struggling with how to do that. Okay. Is it an issue of uh, finding the right tools? Is mm -hmm. it? A, I mean, I assume this is why everyone's here at the conference, to figure out what they should be doing and hop on the train right. and stay ahead of the game. I think it's a combination of things because mm -hmm. one of the biggest, um, I guess, uh, obstacles to it is mm -hmm. just cost. Okay. Right? So mm -hmm. if you talk to any IT leaders, they will say, you know, if you said, what's your biggest challenge right now? And they said, cutting costs. Mm -hmm. Now, their biggest mandate is innovation. Right. So it's kind of that innovator's dilemma, right? It's like if you only focus here and you're on scarcity where you're just thinking about how can I cut costs out of my infrastructure, mm -hmm. you know, how can I squeeze a little bit more out of VMware because my virtualization is too expensive, you're yeah. never going to focus over here, mm -hmm. right? And look at new applications and new cloud services, um, new customer engagement, you know, mm -hmm. uh, technologies. And so most people here are saying, how do I even start to move on this journey? when mm -hmm. I'm dying. And security is the other big piece, right? Yes. So if I move over here, where's my data? Yeah. But it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy because what's happening by not moving there, uh -huh. people are going around them, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So uh, application developers, if they want to develop new apps because mm -hmm. the business is saying, bring me these new apps for my customers faster, right. they'll just go to a public cloud, mm -hmm. right? Or if you don't give them great kind of cloud storage, they'll just mm -hmm. go to you know, a collaboration like Dropbox, yeah. which scares IT to death, right? Because there's no mm -hmm. control, there's no security, they don't know where their data is. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to figure this out, and that's what people are saying. How do I get there without losing control? Mm -hmm. You know, how do I get them to not go around me? How do I have a seat at the table? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not a totally different conversation, but it's just happening so much faster, and there's so many choices that the business have today yes. that they don't need IT necessarily. Mm -hmm. So it's how do you keep that? Yeah, And we should introduce for our listeners a little bit more about what Red Hat does. Yeah. We, I mean, many of us are familiar with Linux and yeah. know that Red Hat is a major provider. Right. Um, 
when it comes to this sort of innovation and in cloud computing, yeah. where do you fit in? It's a great question. So yeah, so our foundation was obviously Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and mm -hmm. we've been doing that since I don't know, 15 years since we were founded. Um, and now we've we've basically gone up the stack, as we say mm -hmm. in tech. Um, so in addition to the operating system, mm -hmm. we now have cloud infrastructure software, mm -hmm. and we base that on OpenStack, which okay. is a, a really fast-growing community. Um, so you can kind of we call it infrastructure as a service or cloud infrastructure mm -hmm. software. If people are familiar with all the as a service, so you've got SaaS mm -hmm. or IaaS or PaaS, mm -hmm. you know, I always say, you know, which as is right for you as a human? Because <laughs> <laughs> there's so many, it's like there's a new as every day. Yeah. But, um, and then we also have middleware. Mm -hmm. um, so if you think about it from integration or messaging, that type of thing that kind of is the glue in, in, in a IT stack. Mm -hmm. um, then we also have management, uh, both from, um, you know, across kind of a hybrid environment. And then we have application development platforms. So mm -hmm. helping developers, you know, develop uh, mobile apps or develop new um, digital native apps or cloud native apps. And so mm -hmm. we tie that all together. And then, you know, we obviously are trying to do better security and all those things. And what's unique is that entire stack is open source. Yes. So our promise is that everything we do is based on pure open source. We, everything goes back to the upstream community, mm -hmm. um, but we make it enterprise ready. So you know that when you're you know, using software from Red Hat, it's mm -hmm. been validated, it's been tested, it's supported. We're yes. going to help you manage the life cycle you know, mm -hmm. of that software. Uh, and you have our team you know, behind you. So that's, that's always kind of been our competitive differentiation, and mm -hmm. it continues to be so. Mm -hmm. And at the conference, the PTC conference mm -hmm. where we met, uh, there's a lot of people involved in various kinds of network um, both laying down cable and yeah. people who are, you know, trying to round up the investors to, you know, put in these uh, major infrastructure projects. Right. People who are running, um, you know, satellite communications mm -hmm. or, you know, distributing um, information for the um, telecoms. Yeah. Uh, it was also interesting to see that there are so many people involved with data centers. And I assume right. we work a lot with them. We do, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you could almost say that data center modernization, mm -hmm. you know, how they're doing that. And one of the things I always like to say is, does your cloud need its own data center? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. a lot of these companies, even telcos, have always relied on building out their own infrastructure. Okay. But the cost of doing that with all these new technologies, mm -hmm. right, or even optimizing what you've got and, and having better power, better performance, do you mm -hmm. put an all new blade um, servers mm -hmm. and new racks? And there's just a huge cost. Mm -hmm. um, but what's driving the build out is the amount of data and all these, yes. these new technologies, right? I mean, if you look at the data growth, it's just you know, astronomical. And mm -hmm. so they're trying to keep up with that through a build out. Um, and the question I was asking a lot of people yesterday mm -hmm. when I spoke there was, what is your core competence? If your core yes. competency is laying cable, why are mm -hmm. you building data centers? Right? Why wouldn't mm -hmm. you outsource that? Like, give it to yeah. someone who all they do is data centers. Mm -hmm. And so I think what you're going to see, if these companies are going to survive, mm -hmm. frankly, is you're going to decide, what is my core competency? Okay. What, can I, what do I need to focus on? Because I've got to be innovative. I can't be innovative if all I'm doing is building out infrastructure, if that's not what I do to make money. Mm -hmm. And then who does that to make money? Because that's all they're going to be focused on. And they're going to be more secure. They're mm -hmm. going to be more innovative. You know, they're going to bring me the latest technology, but I don't have to pay for it in that way, mm -hmm. right? And so there's kind of this rebalancing across the industry, whereas before they used to do everything, right, in yeah. addition to lay cable. And so data centers are changing a lot. And so mm -hmm. um, yesterday, for example, I moderated a panel, and there were two data center companies on this panel. Mm -hmm. One is building massive global data centers. I'm talking, you know, football fields size yeah. data centers mm -hmm. to handle storage, to handle, you know, these huge new, um, you know, very data heavy workloads. Mm -hmm. And they're looking to do, you know, similar to what we saw in the past, which was pick these, you know, major areas, build these huge data centers mm -hmm. and allow people to leverage that. And what's interesting about that is you can be in a data center where it's almost like your supply chain is there. So your vendors might be in that same data center. Oh, your okay. customers might be in that mm -hmm. same data center. So it's almost like you're having this, this global ecosystem <laughs> of, of transferring data and communication within mm -hmm. a data center. Mm -hmm. And you could be based wherever. You might, yeah. you know, So it, does this mean that people choose their data center got it. based on where are their customers and suppliers you got and partners it. And are? that is a change, right? Oh, because you're not so building out your own data center. You're saying, mm -hmm. oh, this is interesting, so, mm -hmm. you know, 
Red Hat has a huge you know, data center there. Um, I want to be near them. So you start mm -hmm. to look at this kind of localized, globalized <laughs> ecosystem. I don't know what to mm -hmm. call it. But, and then this other data center company was building very small, niche, high density, high performing mm -hmm. data centers all over the place. Okay. So think, um, you know, these much smaller things, and what they were optimizing for was Internet of Things. Okay. So closer to the data, closer to the sensors, closer to the devices, closer mm -hmm. to the end users. Mm -hmm. Super, super fast. The data's got to yeah. get there in, you know, milliseconds or whatever, real-time mm -hmm. transactions. So, um, you know, an example might be there are sensors, you know, on a, on a train track, and you've got to right. make sure that, you know, the information you're getting you know, every second about what's happening on that is being constantly mm -hmm. sent to, to control or whatever so that yes. trains don't crash into each other or whatever mm -hmm. it is. Um, and a lot of it is consumer applications, right? right. So what's happening <laughs> every single second. But yeah. it's so powerful because it's not just consumer. It could be, you know, there's a plane in the air and mm -hmm. you want real-time information of what's happening in that engine at a thousand different places on that engine all in real yeah. time. So you start to think about how this is being applied mm -hmm and how do we get that data where it needs to be quickly, it mm -hmm. just changes the way we think. Because at the end of the day, it's still going through a pipe. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're, still, we're still tied to some physical thing. Even though we call mm -hmm. it cloud, <laughs> you know, there's all this physical infrastructure behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting to see, I mean, from a consumer perspective, there's just dozens of new devices you could have in any person's right. home. I spoke to one person earlier this weekend who said his you know, connection was running a bit slower and then he realized he had like 56 different internet enabled devices right. in his house. Um, but yes, the industrial internet and mm -hmm. um, uh, more commercial applications yeah. are also going to be, I think, maybe where there's more value in 2016. Just I'm getting the impression that there's a lot of, um, you know, easy, uh, use cases mm -hmm. in the industrial and manufacturing side that, oh, I, I mean, saying. it's mm -hmm. it's it's more convenient for individuals too, right. but in terms of, you know, coming up with something with a business, business model, are you? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I could almost look at any industry, whether it's mm -hmm. B2B, business to business, or B2C, business to consumer, and there are so many new ways of using the technologies mm -hmm. we have available, um, and I think it's just going to be do you get there, do you figure that out, or does some startup beat you to it? Okay. Right, because this landscape, because the technology is so available, and it's, mm -hmm. it's, you're able to go to the cloud and not have it be your infrastructure, right? So it's mm -hmm. inexpensive, relatively speaking. It used to be yeah. we had to build out our own networks, right? Mm -hmm. And we don't have to do that anymore. Do you think there are going to be better standards for interconnecting devices from different manufacturers? Is Interesting. So I like to say open standards, mm -hmm. right? Okay. And this has been mm -hmm. something we've talked about for many, many years. I think the the promise of where we're going in 2016 and really the next five years mm -hmm. is that's actually happening now. That you're realizing that the only way we can share this data, share this mm -hmm. information, interoperate across devices, across platforms, across mm -hmm. networks, is if we're all using the same open standards. And I say open because they're almost always open source or at least open APIs, mm -hmm. right? Um, and one of the kind of predictions that I've been thinking about from t for 2016 or the next kind of couple years is that you know that open API infrastructure is really going to become the way that we all do business. Mm -hmm. There's outliers, Apple and Amazon, mm -hmm. but the majority of the industry, Microsoft, mm -hmm. they're open sourcing.net, which is their kind of mm -hmm. application uh, development framework, right? Mm -hmm. No one would have guessed that a few years ago. Right, so right. they realize that they have got to be able to interoperate regardless mm -hmm. of whether it's a Microsoft environment or a Linux environment or a Google environment. We all need to be able to communicate in an mm -hmm. open standardized way because that's what the customer needs, yes. right? And, and that's, that's just different, but that's because the customers now have that power to say, no, I need you to play nice together. <laughs> Definitely. And we used to say, oh, okay, and then we wouldn't do it. But now, it, you know, and that's what I love about open source. Yeah. We'll come back and hear more about that and the potential for open source in just a minute. Thank you very much. I'm Nicole Horry for Think Tech Talks, here with Margaret Dawson from Red Hat. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Come join us every Friday at 2 p.m. when I interview interesting scientists about what they do, why they do it, and why we should all care about it. It's a lot of fun to see. We hear, and you can learn interesting stuff. You'll hear all kinds of fascinating science, and we know you'll have a great time. Hope to see you then. Bye bye. Aloha, how you doing? I'm Gordo the Texar. 
here on Think Tech Hawaii, where we co-host Hibachi Talk, where we talk about technology and bring in all kinds of cool guests. Also, my co-host with me today is Andrew, Andrew, the, the, Andrew the security guy. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching Think Tech Hawaii, and thanks for watching Hibachi Talk. We also have Angus. And you there, lad. It's Angus. I bring in all kinds of wee things. Oh, look, you see my lips moving. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm Nicole Horry with Think Tech Talks, back with Margaret Dawson from Red Hat. And uh, just during the break, we were talking about uh, Hawaii's uh, interactions yeah. with the conference here. We met at the PTC conference in Waikiki, held at the Hilton Hawaiian Village every single year. Yep. And um, I have to admit, it was very international, more international than I had realized. Yeah. People from all over the world trying to figure out what yep. system's going to work for them. But actually, I did meet a fair number of people from here on Oahu as well. Hmm. Uh, there were some researchers from UH. Yep. So there's, um, and we did interview them. So this will be hopefully showing up on oh, the OC16 episode next uh, Sunday night. Um, anyway, they uh, explained that they have a program for observatories using hmm. uh, 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 the cables that are no longer in use for data transmission, mm -hmm. and so basically, they're you know looking around to see you know if they can install additional sensors on the cables before they get laid down, mm -hmm. and then once they're no longer in use and get turned over to scientific research, then they're correspondingly way more useful. Right. So that'll be interesting. I think it's a very uh, long-term project. Yeah. But, uh, but I think that's a great point. I mean, we, it, it's kind of the way we should be thinking about mm -hmm. the Internet of Things or the Internet of Everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. It's like if we're already doing something, is it really going to cost that much more to put some kind of sensor in that while we're laying it down? Right. Whereas then we can have the data, and it could even mm -hmm. be for repairs, yeah. right? Imagine if you had sensors, you know, in all that fiber and something happened. You would know from mm -hmm. the sensors where that breakage was or, you know, whatever it was, which today we can't do that. Right. And I think it will help them significantly in determining where it makes sense to lay cables in the future. What areas are yeah. safe, yeah. you know, what kind of problems you can run into. Even and from natural uh, disasters or yeah, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Well, underwater landslides actually are one of the main things they worry about. So I think it's interesting because you know, what I was saying before mm -hmm. on break was we all come here to Hawaii, but we don't stop and think about, you know, is Hawaii some amazing technical hub? It doesn't have right. that reputation. Yeah. And right? I do think it has strengths, uh, particularly mm -hmm. in ocean research. So I also ran into someone else I knew today who works for Makai Ocean Research. That's valid. And, um, you know, they're also affiliate, you know, the work they do is with the um, cable industry to um, help plan out where to lay these underwater From cables. From underwater cables, yeah. And yeah. also um, just, you know, do that planning process and, you know, go through the cable laying process. I think um, that's fair. I mean, it, when we talk about oceanic sciences or technology, mm -hmm. you're right. I think yeah. Hawaii is up there. It makes sense. There are there. cables coming yeah. ashore here. So the question it's is, are there other things useful. that the, you know, the economy could I be doing? I did see one of my other friends there, though I didn't get to talk to him about what he was doing there. So. Okay. I don't actually know. <laughs> <laughs> he's in tech, or yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. So, um, and he's done. Um, I'm not sure if it one or two startups here, oh, but actually, he and his wife and um, some other people did a startup out of UH when they were mm. um, postdocs there for their PhDs. And um, no, that's great. I mean, I you know, think you know. I think when we come from Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. Seattle, Boston, you know, these huge tech hubs, um, you know. Hawaii does not come to mind necessarily. It's like, oh, you know, that's the computer science hub of the world or the technology yeah. hub of the world. So I think that, I think Hawaii could do more to really promote themselves yeah. as a technology. Yeah, um, there's really good incubators here. Yeah, see, that's um, So we idea. have like um, blue startups and, you know, they've won awards as, um, you know, being really, you know, compared to some of these other, um, some of the other incubators, I think they made it to the top 10 list. And you probably have credibility around so. environmental sciences, ocean mm -hmm. science. I I've mean, also there, been really hubs. impressed with the Accelerate UH. So that's hmm. an incubator program that Sultan Ventures and UH have come together on. And uh, basically, you'll have 
people with really interesting research getting help uh, commercializing it, hmm. students who might be interested in starting something, oh, that's great. going to them for that that's kind great. of you know advice. And I'll have to look just, into that more because yeah. I work with a lot of accelerators and startups back oh, you know, really? on the mainland, and mm -hmm. it's like uh, especially around women in tech or girls in tech and yes. that type of thing. So that's great. I will definitely look into that. Yeah, I do think there's been a major change in the tech industry and the number of people working in startups here in just yeah. you know the last four or five years. Well, it goes back to that accessibility. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. one, there's funding, which there wasn't a few years ago, but there, it's a very rich venture, right. an mm -hmm. angel funding mm -hmm. um, ecosystem, really worldwide. Yeah. Um, but also, it's easy to start something, right? I can go, you know, swing up mm -hmm. an instance on a public cloud and start, you know, writing a new app, and you know, mm -hmm. it can show up in mobile devices literally within minutes if I wanted to, or a new game or whatever. So mm -hmm. that ability to innovate and create something without having this huge capital expenditure is kind of the way of the future and now. And so it's very right. exciting. And it's also more easy or more feasible to work remotely. So right. one of my roommates right. actually works remotely with a mainland company and he's a software developer and I have a bunch of other friends who are either doing that now or used to do that. Right. And you know, there's also local companies that, you know, people are always getting, you know. <laughs> the hardest thing with that is the time frame. <laughs> Having been at 4 a.m. meetings this entire <laughs> week because my colleagues are on the East Coast. That's, I think if you live in Hawaii, you just got to be yeah. a morning person. I do think more people <laughs> here are morning people. I think you have uh, to be. It's, yeah. That's it's nice. funny. That's funny. <laughs> so anyway, I, I, I think there's a lot to look forward to in the tech industry here in Hawaii, especially here on Oahu. But, you know, I've seen good things from Maui and the Big Island, too. and. You know, sometimes people from like Kauai makers or other groups will come out from Kauai. So I, I think it's it's a global phenomenon. So I think that you know Hawaii can help by mm -hmm. you know promoting themselves beyond agriculture and tourism and the things we kind of think of um, yeah. typically, you know, stereotypically uh, mm -hmm. from the mainland because you do have great universities. Um, it sounds like you've got investment. So I, I think mm -hmm. that it's so easy. For really anyone to be successful and even though we still look at the MITs of the world I think where innovation is coming from you know can be really anywhere um, from any university yeah. and that's around the world I mean you look at countries like India China but you even look at you know places like the Czech Republic um, mm -hmm. you know or Ukraine and there's just massive innovation yes. happening everywhere yes you know I know you mentioned that you've worked with um, women in technology yep. and what do you think has been successful in terms of <laughs> yeah. involving more women I don't know if we've been successful, um, frankly. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there there is a growing number of women, but if you look at our percentages, we mm -hmm. have not grown, right? We're still, mm -hmm. or you go to these conferences, I mean, y you could walk around, how many women did you see? And when you get mm -hmm. to the executive level, I can tell you it becomes much more sparse. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, one of the things is it's very easy, and I hear a lot of women doing this, saying, you know, men need to support women more. Mm -hmm. And frankly, I would say women need to support women more. So there is not, I don't think, a an intentional support by enough women, especially women executives, mm -hmm. to kind of bring younger women up, mentoring, coaching, um, that's one thing. And then I think we are seeing a huge improvement in the programs for younger girls. So if you look yes. at, I mean, there's geek girls and um, you know, women who code and, and black girls who code and um, you know, just a ton of very more grassroots organizations mm -hmm. that are making a huge difference. Yeah. Um, and encouraging girls, because where we see the break is around 12 or 13. Okay. Like you look at younger girls and mm -hmm. boys and up to the point where they're, you know, 9, 10, 11, 12, mm -hmm. they still have that attitude of, yeah, I can do anything. I can be a rocket scientist. I can be a programmer. I can mm -hmm. do whatever. And then something happens around puberty where all mm -hmm. of a sudden we start to, you know, oh, you don't need to take that hard math class. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was done. Like I thought that was just me, you know, many, 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 many years ago, you know, <laughs> in the early 70s. But it turns out we're still doing that same. And I think it's mm -hmm. unintentional. And that's what I mean by we must be more intentional. Like yeah. we need to be intentional about the conversations we have mm -hmm. and the way that we talk to boys and girls, especially in the United States where we're so far behind in yeah. science and technology and say, yeah, you can do it. Go for it. Take calculus. You know, you can mm -hmm. be anything you want to be. And we can't lose that because that's what really America was founded on. And for mm -hmm. some reason, we start to stifle people or start to, you know, kind of limit their choices. It's like, oh, you're not that smart. Where a lot of people figure things out much later in life. I mean, I did not study mm -hmm. technology. It was when I was living in Asia that I found, wow, I like this actually excites me. Really? And then I realized I actually get this. Mm -hmm. Like, I want to talk about network security. <laughs> this is really interesting to me. Yeah, let's let's talk about SSL VPNs, you know, and and mm -hmm. uh, security protocols. Sure, let's go there, you know. And 
I d didn't know that, but no one was stopping me then. They were just like, "Oh, great! Could you do this now?" Yeah, yeah, I could do that. You know, mm -hmm. and so, so did I think you approach it from a reporting side then. Yeah, so I mean, I, I am a communications major mm -hmm. in college, mm -hmm. uh, and my background really started in the automotive industry because I grew up. My dad was in the automotive industry, so I okay. love like fast muscle cars. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I was used to being in male-dominated <laughs> areas because yes. the automotive <laughs> industry is also mostly men. Um, but uh, I went over to Asia and ended up staying there for a while and went into journalism mm -hmm. and started interviewing um, a lot of Taiwanese um, CEOs. And, and you mm -hmm. think about Taiwan at that point was really moving from OEM, ODM to you know major brand companies. Yes. So you think about Taiwan Semiconductor, MyTac, Asus, you know, they're brands mm -hmm. that now in the industry we know fairly well. Mm -hmm. It was really the beginning of that uh, mm -hmm. when I was there in the early 90s. And I would interview these, these business leaders and I realized I want to be on that side. <laughs> like this is cool. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just started moving towards that. And there were not that many women and I started it, I guess you could say late, but if you have that that hunger, that interest, and you've got to want to learn. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, I think that's true in anything. Mm -hmm. um, and you can't, you know, take people saying, oh, you didn't have that background, mm -hmm. um, you know, as, as a reason to not try. Um, and so mm -hmm. I think it's, and, and I think the great thing about technology as a field is that you just have to prove that you can do it. Like okay. if you're a coder, let's, mm -hmm. I, we really don't care what your background is. At the end of the day, that's one of the few kind of white collar jobs mm -hmm. where if you can show us what you're coding, yes. um, and it works, great, welcome, right? It doesn't have mm -hmm. that. I mean, how many people, you know, even at Google today, I'm sure there's, there's still those people that don't have college degrees, but they're mm -hmm. amazing, mm -hmm. right? And so I, I think that we don't want to lose that. Um, and, and it's interesting because when I was um, working at a very large IT company out mm -hmm. of Seattle, I'll let you guess which one that is, um, I'll never forget this day where we had this meeting and it was um, kind of the senior leadership team and the VP had asked a couple people to put together criteria uh -huh. for who we were going to hire in leadership positions. Mm -hmm. And so um, these two people put together, you know, what schools do we want them to go to? What mm -hmm. companies would they have worked to worked mm -hmm. for before? And the schools were all MBA schools, um, mm -hmm. or their BA would have been from, you know, just Ivy League or Stanford or okay. you know whatever. Uh -huh. And so he's like, oh, thanks very much. This is great. He's like, so would anyone in this room not have been hired based on this criteria? Uh -huh. I'd be like, yeah, that would be me. <laughs> you know? and he's like, no, 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 it doesn't matter because you know you're really good at what you do. And I said, that's not what you asked, <laughs> right? What yeah. you? I mean, I went to the University of Puget Sound oh, in Tacoma, okay. Washington, which we had a lot of Hawaiians actually. We had a yeah, very large yeah. Hawaiian population <laughs> there. But it's not known for technology. I got a, like I said, a degree in communications. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to be careful not to limit people before we let them prove themselves. Okay. Um, and I think that's a message for men and women. Right. Let them yeah. prove themselves, and and don't lose that entrepreneurial kind of innovation streak that makes technology and our country so great. Because mm -hmm. you know, I think that you can really do whatever you want to do if people give you the opportunity. Yeah. Um, as you look at uh, where you want to see the cloud computing and mm -hmm. um, you know apps uh, going along with that, um, do you think that this is something where you see more women getting involved, or is it something where there's still a big gender divide? There's still a huge gender divide. Mm -hmm. um, I will say cloud computing and, and kind of today's tech industry offers a greater opportunity for women, and I think it goes back to so much is happening that is the user experience. Mm -hmm. And not to be, not to be gender, gender stereotypical, but um, I think that women are good in general. In, in figuring out what is important to the customer and always bringing mm -hmm. that voice of the customer. Um, and because a lot of women kind of started on that marketing side because in some ways you can say they were allowed to or you can say it was their nature. I, I, we don't okay. need that argument, uh -huh. but I think there's a lot more women in more of the creative mm -hmm. marketing communication side. And so there's an opportunity to move over to the more of the technical side, uh -huh. but also make sure that you're really contributing those to new technologies and new innovations. Okay. And I think we need to get beyond that the only entry into tech is mm -hmm. if you come from the computer science, okay. right? That is one mm -hmm. entry point. And that's what I, you know, when I coach um, women of all ages, I mean, I, I would say that it's not just young women that I mentor. There's women mm -hmm. in their 40s that I mentor because mm -hmm. they're trying to figure out how to kind of kick themselves into that next place, right, and, and yeah. move up. And 
I think we automatically think, oh, I, you know, I don't have a CS degree, or um, I don't write code, so I can't do this, or mm -hmm. I can't lead technologists, and that's just not true. Mm -hmm. So what kind of background do women who start working in this area you know, sometimes come from? Sometimes it's computer science, sometimes uh -huh. it's um, electrical engineering, but okay. it's also sometimes, you know, business or oh, okay. communications. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, what are you passionate about? Mm -hmm. You know, what do you want to contribute? What mm -hmm. do you want to do? And like I said, showing passion for something and being willing to learn something and digging in and finding mm -hmm. that, you know, you may be able to have a technical conversation with engineers and maybe you're mm -hmm. not doing, you know, the, the actual building of that, but you can be credible. Uh -huh. um, nobody cares what your background was at that point, right? And so I think that we just need to be open to their many ways to get to technology. And plus that we have such a rich online education system, community college where you can go back and take you know, programming yes. classes if you want to, or mm -hmm. you can dig into network security, or you can get certifications. Um, and with open source, we need more women to contribute to the community. And that's a okay. great way to learn because mm -hmm. nobody cares who you are, right? I, mean, yeah. I don't care if you're a woman sitting in, you know, Alaska or you know wherever, um, if you can contribute value to that community, you're mm -hmm. welcome. Yes. And that's the power, I think, of open source also. That's wonderful. We'll find out more about this when I, we come back from our break. Uh, I'm Nicole Horry with Think Tech Talks here with Margaret and from Red Hat. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back in a minute. Thank you. Aloha. My name is Reg Baker, and I'm the host of Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. Business in Hawaii is a program that is positive stories about business in Hawaii. Uh, we're tired of hearing the negativity and why it's the wrong place to have a business. We talk about the positive reasons for having a business in Hawaii and, and how to be successful. We broadcast live every Thursday at 2 o'clock. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. Hi, my name is Hilary Weinberg. I'm the host of The Whole Gamut on ThinkTech Hawaii. See us live every Tuesday at 1 p.m or on our YouTube channel to hear us talk about world affairs from Hawaii and beyond. See you then. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. That's Ted Ralston. You know, Ted is the uh, host of uh, Where the Road Leads. It shows uh, every Friday from 4 to 5 p.m. It's about technology. It's about how people collaborate and, and solve problems with modern technology. It's where the road leads. We all know that. We should all be listening. Join us there. 4 to 5 p.m. every Friday. Now, what about that do you agree with? All of it. I knew he'd say that. Aloha. Say aloha. Aloha. Good. I'm Nicole Horry with Think Tech Talks, and we're here with Marga Dawson from Red Hat talking about how people can get involved in open source and how the open source community is actually powering things like cloud computing as well. Right. Right. So, uh, just tying back into what you were saying about the possibility for people from all over the world right. to contribute to open source projects, how does that usually work? And for projects right. like yours where you're doing you know, the stack that's right. working behind the scenes to power the cloud, uh, what kind of um, projects are people teaming up on? So if we look globally, there are literally uh, millions of open source projects. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I couldn't even name them all. Um, and so the great thing is the, the the bar of entry is very low, right? It may be just for a, you know, a, a game, you know, and people want to open source mm -hmm. that. So any code you can open source um, and create a project. What we do at Red Hat is we kind of look at that universe and say, okay, mm -hmm. which of these really fits into what we're trying to do for our customers. Mm -hmm. And we may start really contributing and, and paying attention to, to that project. Mm -hmm. And then if we want to actually create a product, you know, a software oh. product to take to our enterprise, mm -hmm. you know, we tend to um, create a project from that community. Okay. Um, but I think that if you look at that universe, it's really you can find something that you're interested in. So if you mm -hmm. are a gamer, for example, uh -huh. it's like, do you want to contribute to an open source game? And a lot of that is going on, especially with younger people. Um, and that's a great way to contribute. On um, cloud computing, there's a ton of different um, open source uh, projects. So the mm -hmm. one that we're, one of the ones from an infrastructure um, layer that we're most involved with is called OpenStack. I mentioned it at the mm -hmm. beginning. And literally there are OpenStack contributors from around the globe. Mm -hmm. And some of them are very, very active. Some work for companies like Red Hat, mm -hmm. some okay. don't. Uh -huh. that they just love you know, being part of this. And, and the interesting thing is you know, open source is, is really a meritocracy, right? So the yes. best ideas win, mm -hmm. um, not always the loudest voice, which is more mm -hmm. the, you know, the other <laughs> side of it. Um, and anyone that's able to can contribute, but there's kind of this mm -hmm. self 
um, validating self-policing behavior that goes on, right? Yeah. And so one of the fallacies that, that people used to have about open source is that it was less secure, right? Because oh. everybody can oh. see the code, right? right? And <laughs> I will tell you, I still have to argue, especially with people in some industries, and I, I won't uh -huh. name names, but that think that, well, that sounds very scary to me. Like, I just mm -hmm. want the box, you know, mm -hmm. and I said, so think about that. You want to see the black box where you can't see anything, or you've got this over here where literally it's completely transparent. Yes. Right? And so when there was Heartbleed or some of these right. other huge things, right, I mean, it was like the community around the globe, <laughs> from Russia to L.A., I mean, you name it, and it was 24-7. Right. So right. think about if you're a company building proprietary software, mm -hmm. and you have you know, a piece of malware or some other, you know, threat against your software, which will happen, right? right. It's not, it's not, it's not an if, it's a when. Mm -hmm. Can you do that 24-7 and have millions of people looking for the, the problem and fix it? No. Yeah. And that is the power of open source. Though it does seem like some of the enterprise software especially has certain expectations about, you know, how much resources you commit to a certain thing. I mean, you look at the right. importance of uh, that, um, encryption technology, yep. it seems like it would easily warrant more than like like the one or two people who are working on it at right. the time. It's but that's the power. So if mm -hmm. you think about it, it's the it, what we leverage is the best of both worlds. Okay. So we're leveraging this amazing global community, mm -hmm. you know, for innovation, for contributing to code, for helping make it secure. So, yeah. so think about you have the power so of that. So when anything does get incorporated from the community, you are ensuring that it is getting enough eyes on it. You got it. Okay. So then what we do is kind of that, you know, that validation, that mm -hmm. enterprise readiness, and importantly, we manage the life cycle. So okay. let's say it's not a critical patch, mm -hmm. right? That it's not a heart bleed. It's just an, an update. Here's a mm -hmm. new release. The, the value of working with a company like Red Hat is we say, okay, let's manage how that goes out throughout your, your IT environment. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you were going straight to the community, you'd be having code you know, updates constantly, right? Because yes. you think about the cycle. Well, that would be absolute chaos to an enterprise <laughs> IT environment, right? Which one of the things they need to do is be stable. Yes. Right, because if you think about your employees or your customers, I mean, imagine a bank that was like doing these releases constantly, it would be chaos, right? You can't mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. And so that's the benefit. You're getting this incredible benefit of this global community, mm -hmm. but you're also getting the benefit of stability, reliability, security, testing, support, yeah. and that management of those updates, of that life cycle, you know, and so that you can keep a stable IT environment. Right, and then for the benefits for the community, for people who get involved, would be credibility and being able to point exactly. to their GitHub and say, "Hey, I look, I yeah, did look what all I contributed. You got it. You got it. You bet." And mm -hmm. then it's really easy to get a job from that, you know. <laughs> and I think that yeah. that's also we go we went back to opportunities. Mm -hmm. You start contributing to one of these projects, especially one that you know there's a major IT company involved, mm -hmm. and you become a you know a, a big contributor, mm -hmm. or maybe you just you know do one thing, but uh -huh. you can make noise about it and you can be involved, or maybe you get on a committee. Right, there's yeah. other ways to get involved, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden when you go to a major IT vendor that's involved with that and you show your resume, and you can say, yeah, here, look at my, you know, my code on GitHub. Mm -hmm. And the engineering manager can look at that and say, wow, this is really good. You know, why did you do it this way? Or, you mm -hmm. know, and you can have this conversation that you would have never been able to have. Right. And so it's a wonderful way to level the playing field, create this global base of opportunity, and we don't care where you live. You, know, you could be yeah. in Dublin, you could be in you know, wherever. Yeah. So. And I feel like this is the area where you're actually getting the most acceleration in terms of oh, innovation. Absolutely. Because, you know, if people create, you know, solve a problem once and then it's in a black box, no one gets to use right. that and it doesn't really, you know, progress humanity to the next level. Well, and what's great from a customer perspective, we have some mm -hmm. customers that actually contribute to the upstream <laughs> because uh -huh. they're like, hmm, I really like this feature. You know, and I've talked to Red Hat about it, and I know they're uh -huh. going to try to, you know, influence that. But you know what? I'm going to start contributing to the community and also influence. So it's a way for even enterprise IT to mm -hmm. take advantage of that innovation, to think about what are they trying to do, mm -hmm. um, and not, you know, fork off from the kernel or, you know, uh -huh. create uh -huh. some customization, which would mm -hmm. break their ability to easily, you know, stay with that, that whole mm -hmm. innovation cycle, um, but still be part of that. Yeah, and so, so it's not necessarily something that's going to be proprietary. Right. By definition, it's going to be open to anyone who wants to use it, but then right. the whole community might be contributing and improving and keeping it alive right. long into the future. Exactly. And then I, I think the key thing goes back to what we were talking about earlier with interoperability and integration, mm -hmm. right? Oh, so, yes. you know, you're still going to have some proprietary software and systems. I mean, because mm -hmm. in the past, I mean, people have invested, you know, millions of dollars in, say, SAP 
or something, mm -hmm. right? And, and have a legacy um, system around that. So how do you make that work and interoperate then with this kind of new era of, of very you know open and agile mm -hmm. and cloud applications or workloads? And yes. so I think that's another place that open source can really um, play a key role. Mm -hmm. Will this also allow people to do more um, you know, reconfigurations of the settings on their Oh, everything is customized. Yeah, I can tell you, I used to be in the integration space in the day and doing these, what we call B2B mm -hmm. connectors or, you know, integrations across uh -huh. a, an enterprise service bus and everything had to be customized mm -hmm. um, because nobody in those days, especially with those old ERP, CRM systems, you know, that mm -hmm. were pre-cloud, there is not one implementation of that that is not highly, highly customized. Mm -hmm. So when you try to do like these just, you know, standardized connectors or standardized integration um, mm -hmm. things, you can't because mm -hmm. all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, they've totally changed the templates. And so if we mm -hmm. try to, you know, do a, an order to cash integration, they've actually changed the way they do invoices, you know, even, you know, in a standardized SAP environment or whatever it is. Okay. And mm -hmm. so I, I think that going back to the open standards, the more we can do that, the faster mm -hmm. we can move. We don't get locked into this kind of customized, very, very expensive. Yeah. Just because it's so time consuming for whoever has to come in and tweak it. Right. right? And then go back to that data. Mm -hmm. So back then, we didn't have so much data. Oh. So you could say, okay, I'm doing invoices. Uh -huh. I'm doing purchase orders. Mm -hmm. Right. Now times that by 100,000 bits, mm -hmm. you know, petabytes of data mm -hmm. that you need to move across these different applications. And why? Because you need intelligence from them going to big data, right? Because uh -huh. I need to know what my customers are doing so I can actually target them in a better way, mm -hmm. increase my revenue, but decrease my costs. And I can't do that if I can't bring that data together. Yeah. Now or one if I'm thing in the conference description synopsis made it, um, I did get the impression that there was going to be more talk about AI and the use of computing yeah. resources to maybe come up with a more customized result leveraging the big data instead yeah. of struggling against it. I think Is we're still very early days. Yeah, I mean, okay. when we talk about machine learning, artificial intelligence, you know, a lot of those areas, um, even robotics, if you want to take oh. it to that mm -hmm. place. Um, I think that is a wonderful, sexy future that we are seeing some beginning mm -hmm. um, steps in, but yes. still very, very early. So if I, if I okay. put that in perspective, there's probably about 30% of enterprises and even telcos that don't even have a cloud strategy. Oh, right. Okay. So they're just trying to figure out what am I going to do with cloud computing. I'm sure they've mm -hmm. got some of their developers in a public cloud, but I'm talking from a from an enterprise wide perspective. They have not fully put together their cloud strategy. Right. Um, chances are they don't have a big data strategy. Mm -hmm. Right. And Internet of Things, they're just like you know. And if I try to bring up <laughs> containers or any of these other new technologies, you know, they're just like, you know. Um, so we need to remember that because sometimes uh -huh. the vendor community and the 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 academic community are five ten years ahead of where people are implementing. Okay. Right. So I think all of those things are happening. We're going to see them in academia mm -hmm. first. We're going to see them in consumer technology first, mm -hmm. um, and then the enterprise will we'll figure it out. But I think we're going to okay. see some very exciting niche applications of that. Yeah. And again, it's going to be in areas like oil and gas. Like think oh, of things that are remote. Okay. Like what's mm -hmm. hard to do with humans? Yes. Right. Because then the investment of that ends up getting returned. Right. You can actually mm -hmm. have a return on that investment because mm -hmm. to put people out there, put bodies on it, is just too cost prohibitive. So yeah. that's when we start getting innovative. That's when we start looking for alternatives. That's when we start looking for, um, you know, more artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and that type mm -hmm. of thing. So we're going to see some cool things, but I, I think we need to be. I always say you know, it'll like, be the high value. Far exactly, things first, exactly. And, and I think you know people are saying, oh, we're going to have all self, uh, you know, self-driving cars in five years, and I'm like, no way. No. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> but maybe that's just me because I love. I told you I love muscle cars. No, if you take oh, away, yes. if you take away my six-speed manual, I'm going to be very sad. But. Um, uh, as someone said yesterday when I, mm -hmm. we were talking about they said, oh, people can still drive, but you will pay incredible oh. insurance amounts because you're going to be the one crashing into self-driving cars. They're not going to crash oh. into Hopefully you. Hopefully it doesn't make you a worse driver. I, <laughs> <laughs> I think the point is that they'll all be automated, right? So yeah. it's almost like, you know, if you think about the Jetsons, it was pure chaos. But um, anyway, I, I think there, that there's, a, there's so much happening that's exciting. I don't even, you know, and that's why I love this industry. It's like, I, I, it's changing so fast every day. How can you not be excited? And to be part of that and watching that, and having a job you love, you know, day after day, you know, it's like people always say, oh, you know, you're thinking about retiring. It's like, I, you know, God, I can't even imagine. Like, in the next yeah. 10 years, it's going to be, I feel like I'm in the prime of my career right now. That's so wonderful. I'm so yeah. glad we got to talk to you. Thank you so Same. much again for coming in today. It's been and fun. Visiting us here in the studio and yeah. for being on Think Tech Talks. 
I'm Nicole Horry with Think Tech Talks here with Margaret Dawson. Uh, we had a wonderful conversation and uh, just so glad we met each other at the conference. Mutual. Thank you. Thank you.